I'm Dr. Artie Kavanaugh, and I'm going to be talking today about safety. With the introduction of novel therapies, we've had extraordinary opportunity to achieve better outcomes in our patients with rheumatic diseases, such as rheumatoid arthritis. We have novel therapies and novel treatment strategies, and the effectiveness has really been remarkable. I'd like to talk today about some new information about opportunistic infections. And we talk about TNF inhibitors, I think it's natural to talk about tuberculosis. And we've certainly learned a lot over the years about TB among patients receiving TNF inhibitors, how to stratify them, that we definitely need to be on the lookout for it. And I'd like to cover a couple of interesting bits of information that were relatively new this year. One deals with non-tuberculous mycobacterial infections. And this was a survey presented at the American College of Rheumatology meeting in 2010, also published in a little bit in earlier in a, in a preliminary form. Looked at a large number of patients who were starting TNF inhibitors across a number of databases and looked for cases of tuberculosis. Uh, they also looked for non-tuberculous mycobacterial infections and something that perhaps shouldn't surprise us but was quite striking is that a very large number of cases of non-tuberculous mycobacteria. About half of these cases were pulmonary, about a third skin and soft tissue, 10% disseminated. The uh, bacteria of Mycobacterium avium intracellulare, Mycobacterium kansasi, and others. The take-home point from this was that as physicians, we need to be aware of these non-tuberculous mycobacteria and add that to the things that we discuss with our patients and also that we watch for as our patients come for visits. Another important opportunistic infection is herpes zoster. Now, the, we've known about the risk of zoster, particularly among older persons, and also with the use of corticosteroids. Some very interesting recent data that deals with a couple of these aspects. Age is, of course, a very consistent risk factor, and many of our patients, particularly with rheumatoid arthritis, are a bit older. In this study, presented last year at the ACR as well, a point that all of us should know it was reinforced quite nicely, and that is prednisone is a risk. A striking thing is that the risk is down to even what most of us would consider relatively low doses of prednisone. Not uncommon that we use these in our treated uh, patients in the clinic. So prednisone is a risk for the development of zoster. The TNF inhibitors are also a risk. As you can see from this slide in the graph, all the TNF inhibitors have about double the risk compared to patients who are receiving traditional DMARDs. A take home point for this is that DMARD use steroid use particularly, and also TNF inhibitor use can increase the risk of herpes zoster infection. To put this in a bit of context and to summarize, I think as we've learned about safety data, we've learned where to get it. This, uh, on this graph here, graphic what you see is a number of published studies and abstracts dealing with this topic. The results are a little bit discrepant, but overall most find that we have an increased risk with TNF inhibitors of developing herpes zoster infection. It's something that we need to watch for, and I think we will add this bit of information, and I think our safety experience is cumulative, and the more we learn about how to look for it among our patients, the better we can do, the better we can treat them, and treat them safely. Let me open it up for some questions. Artie talked about um considering paracella vaccination for all patients in rheumatoid arthritis. What can you tell us about that? Well, I think we've always thought it was a good idea. There's a nice recent study published in the journal JAMA in January, which confirmed earlier data that got the vaccine approved, actually. And that was that with vaccination, you decrease the risk of zoster by about 55% was what they found. So certainly a very good and very indicated strategy to help decrease the risk of this important infection in our treated patients. Many of our patients are already on treatments or being treated when we decide that they need to be vaccinated. So what do we do? How do we treat them? And when do we give them their vaccines? Well, that's an that's a important question. That's a tough one. Exactly as you're saying, one of the things we're hearing is treat to target, treat early, and jump on our patients who have active disease as soon as we can with our best therapies. But with the live vaccines and the zoster vaccine we have available to us right now is a live vaccine, and we're not supposed to use that on, in patients who are receiving concomitant biologic therapy. So that's, that's a tough one. Uh, I've just recently had this come up and uh, said to my patients, if there is an opportunity at which time you're going to be off the, the treatment for some months, maybe anticipated surgery, let's 
think about a vaccination at that time. Uh, a problem in the clinic that we have is is getting the vaccine for some of our patients, and that's a difficulty with the it's most easily approved among our older persons. I think all of our patients really should benefit from this. Or you very nicely point out these issues, but what about screening and testing for people? You know, we have the skin test for TB you now. There's a serum test. Which ones do you use and how do you do it in your clinic? Well, that's tough. Uh, and it's it's who would have thought that we thought TB was an easy infection to consider, but you're right, we've learned about skin testing, we've learned about the, the ex vivo, the uh, interferon releasing assays. So I think we understand TB a lot more from that perspective. These non-tuberculous mycobacterium, they're tough. Uh, chest x-ray really isn't sufficient at detecting things. So do we do CTs on all our patients? I don't think we, I don't think we do. Um, what about clues. Well, it's very difficult as well, and culturing these organisms can be tough, as I think we have all known for many years. And on the other hand, also treating them can be tough. Patients who get treated for non-tuberculous mycobacteria, they will be on some older antibiotics for up to 18 months. So it's a, it's a tough issue, and I think the best thing we can do is really be on the lookout for it and be aware of it, and probably uh, work towards the best treatment that we can.